these chapters so I can condense it. But it's just kind of, these are the things I'm trying to think about because I don't see anybody really talking about that in the scholarship that's out there about food justice and critical animal studies and um, critical vegan studies. So thank you for your time and I open the floor to questions and comments. superfoods, yes, they actually, uh, for the particular cultures they've been basically appropriated from and commodified, yeah, they, they would talk about the, how we kind of grapple with that, because by default, just living in a first world nation, I'm privileged and I, I, I have to actually figure out how I'm going to survive and be healthy in a way that respects particular foods that have been commodified and the spiritual <laughs> relationship so we talk about it and there's no actually easy answer because it's we're still in the process process of decolonizing our brains and you know trying to figure out you know each week first one week we think it's okay then the next week we're like oh my god i didn't think about that <laughs> like not only do particular you know cultures have a spiritual relationship with plants but you know now i'm you know having a package to process by i don't know who and it's being shipped across the globe and you know just all these things so we're, we're talking about we're trying to figure out um you know, how to not rely so much on that. And that's kind of where, if you have access to land or you have a community that has access to land, um, how can we start growing things that, that's like the acai berry. So I learned if you can grow, grow blueberries, it's just as good. So do you have a piece of land where you can grow blueberries locally? And you know, instead of um, relying on spirulina, if it's you know, shipped all the way from Hawaii to wherever you're living, if you're not in Hawaii, can we grow kale? Can that do the same thing? So that's where we start having those conversations. And then it's about like land access, is the land clean enough to grow? And so that's a long answer to your question. Are you going to like bring that whole new gene? Um, so there's been a Tangled Roots, Deborah Barn talks about the tomato, and I talk about that in my work, how depending where your tomatoes come from, most likely most people have grown in their own yard, that even though it's vegan and it's healthy, that like you were saying, that the people who actually pick it don't even have access to healthy foods or healthy conditions, and that they're being exploited as well. So even if you want to become vegan because um, it eliminates cruelty toward animals, what about the cruelty that you still maintain for a particular um, non white racialized communities, usually um, Mexican laborers, um, indigenous Mexicans who don't have um, access to just healthy livelihoods. What does that mean? Um, so it seems really like obviously we talk about the theory and that's really hard to grapple with, but you, you also mentioned that you have a project that you're working on that it sounds like is really putting that into action, maybe, and like in more in organizing people. And so, could you talk about that and sort of how that helps you grapple with those things? Yeah, um, it's called the System Vegan Project, and um, it's about six years old. Um, I put it together in 2005 when I transitioned into veganism after encountering Queen Alpha work, and I had been diagnosed with a fibroid tumor. And I never 
met like a black vegan. I was living in Boston and I thought all the white vegans I know, all the vegans I know are white and I was never convinced to go into veganism because it was always only focused on animals and I didn't see the connection to the work that I was doing. Um, so I did a, a call for papers and looking for black women who practice veganism and kind of seeing, I wonder, you know, if Bell Hooks is right, if Patricia Hill Collins is right, she's right. Collectively, black women experience life differently. Well, we also experience why we do veganism differently. So that's kind of how the project started, and it became this anthology that came out in 2010 called Sister Vegan, Black Female Vegan Speak on Food Identity, Health, and Society. And that's just the book, but um, most of what I do is it's just online, it's virtual communities, and we're just kind of talking to each other, um, more or less, how to deal with um, being a black racialized female subject in America, dealing with racism and you know, normative whiteness um, in mostly white vegan spaces that are post-racial and don't want to have those conversations about how legacies of racism we can still see it today, how it actually constructs our minds, black females, minds collectively differently, our ethics around food and justice very differently from the white racial status quo. So that's kind of what my project does. And it's more like, it's not, it's not really support, but it's just like a gathering of ideas and how we can kind of support each other and then go back into those communities. And um, like for me, uh, how, how do I go, I largely talk to largely white post-racial audiences who really don't understand why is it not everybody wants to be an animal rights vegan? I don't understand Queen of Hua. So that's kind of what the project, it's a, a small slice of what the project does, but it's just kind of inclusive. And I say on the site, you know, I don't tolerate homophobia, transphobia, ages, and ableism. Like, this is not a site for that. This is a site that we're going to, you know, engage in this thing called solidarity and compassion. And now we're looking at our own, you know, black female community. How can we support ourselves, make ourselves healthy without it being at the expense or exploitation of other beings? Does that make sense? Yeah, and it's hard. I mean, there's like no, <laughs> it's always changing. It's really difficult, but that's kind of what we're working through. It's more of a virtual, it's a, it's a way of using social media and the, inter the internet um, as kind of this platform to create changes in the physical. So we meet online, we, we talk a lot, and then we go back to our respective communities and see you know, if we can put those theories into action. Yes? I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about like, the decolonizing aspect of things. Mm -hmm. um, like in particular, it interests me, like I'm, I'm part of Native American, and it's just kind of a subject that has come up and sorry, I'm sorry I'm being so quiet, <laughs> getting shy. But um, I just wanted to hear more about your thoughts on the decolonization aspect, um, especially since, like you noted, like a lot of people are mixed now. And how do you determine, like, what that means to be decolonized, especially since we how we are as people now isn't how people were back then. So anyway, <laughs> yeah, and that's like a really good point because. Um, this is good, this is helping me with my work, so uh, these questions are good. So that's, when I think of Queen Afua's philosophy, I'm thinking, well, she's thinking about something from like thousands of years ago, but that's not how people are now. And, um, you know, we are more mixed, we, we just, you know, despite her being against corporate capitalism, she's using the privileges of capitalism to kind of promote this diet. So, uh, you know, on her book, she has you know a page of all of the appliances you're going to need to become a raw food vegan, and like it's like a Vitamix blender and I don't know, like a, de a dehydrator and stuff that for one, like like you kind of need to be financially secure to afford a lot of this stuff. Uh, so I'm thinking, you know, how does this decolonization thing work? Because as much as she wants to be against the effects of colonialism. You know, she's still using these items that, for all intents and purposes, c come out of, you know, or we benefit from capitalism and colonialism. Um, so it's actually, I think it's a really complex, and you know, there are people who talk about colonialism from all different, decolonialism from all different aspects. Like we've got Queen Afua, who believes that you know you got to go back to Southern Kinetic Egypt, and that's where it is. And then you've got you know of people of indigenous descent in America who are talking about you know. Um, yeah, we're against industrialized farming of animals, but we want to go back to eating animals the way our ancestors did. So, and I'm thinking about how is all of this possible? How, how is it possible to, to do anything from the past? Um, and then your conceptualization of the past is still 
dictated by living in a colonial society. It's like it's like my brain kind of you know it, it overloads. So, and so I think it's it's very complex, and I I've been reading literature that um, you know people talk about what their ways are to decolonize, and it looks like nobody's really agreeing. Nobody's really agreeing with that. And I also think with the mixed question, I think that's uh, becoming more important. I, I do critical race um, theory. Uh, you know, maybe 40 years ago, it seemed like people, you know, you have to stick to one label, and that you're, you are just black, or you, know, you are just Chinese. And then now, at least living in Berkeley, like, uh, everyone that I know, they're, they're kind of more comfortable with, you know, yeah, I'm black, and my, my grandmother was um, Chinese, and my mom is, um, Cherokee Native American, and I, I don't really, I don't fit into any of these models. I'm kind of drawing from, you know, my ancestry from all different you know, uh, angles, and they're kind of producing this new type of, of mixed way of understanding race and, and decolonization. It's very new, but it's getting messy, and um, I think it'll be interesting to see where the scholarship goes to kind of focus more on, you know, not everybody's just, you know, it's just like. 100% anything, no one ever was. So how do we kind of <laughs> figure out that in terms of you know this construction of race? And then you're kind of you know most of us are first world privileged um, nationals and are coming to college uh, as first living in a first world. I mean, we we, we you know, travel from a country that is not necessarily the first world, but now we're reaping those benefits. So how you know how do we kind of figure out you know how race is changing, you know mixed identity, and um, how we kind of incorporate the the sense of decolonization. It's, it's hard. I mean, it's really hard, but um, the conversations are interesting because I, I hear I hear the logic from people who want to do decolonial veganism, and I also hear from people who want to do decolonial um, omnivorism. Is that a word? Um, um, omnivore um, philosophy. And I, 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 I feel like it goes back to geography because I'm a geographer. Um, is it popkin? It almost feels like both may be possible depending on where you live. Like if I live on uh, the parts of the world where it's really cold and all I can do is fish, does it make sense to be vegan by having <laughs> you know like all the stuff shipped out to me that's plant based? But you know the mere fact that it's processed and shipped through is a hurry. Versus what if I just go fish for a while and ask for salmon? Like these are the things that and I'm not supposed to say on camera. Um, <laughs> so I'm vegan. I'm like I'm not. I like, I think this is something that we have to think about. You know, so it's all about place and space and you know, living in capitalism. And it's that's how I would probably answer the question. How we've how I've heard the conversation go, how it's been going when I've when I've been in those those rooms. Um, this is kind of more of a thought than a question. Um, coming from you know someone who's Italian and Irish and uh, Egyptian, Jewish and Christian, and all sorts of things. Um, so when you talk about um, you know, what kind of blender you use to make your vegan foods or um, f even for our communications, like you have to now, with so many people in the world, we use all use Apple computers, which come at the cost of um, a lot of, you know, all over the place. There's 25 different companies that have made parts all over the world inside yeah. of your computer that you're using to discuss how to become vegan. So at a certain point, you really have to just kind of make the best of, of what you have to be able to communicate the best possible thing to do for everybody. Um, and so the yeah, veganism, like what you're saying with um, people who live in Alaska with fish as their main source of protein or um, people living close by the farms with, with all the kale and all those products, it's really, kind of more of just a localization of of what you can do, I feel like, than more than than strictly going to be one thing. But how do you what do you think about localization as opposed to veganism? Um, well there's vegans that are local, so at least where I I live in Berkeley, so it's actually pretty easy if you are probably um, lower middle class to middle class and above it's easy to probably be local vegan or a local olive oil. Um, I think within the context of the whole like push for local and slow foods, I think I find that problematic because um, if you read like most of the literature, it actually assumes that everyone has access to local mm -hmm. um, and you know, geographical and financial access. So I think my problem with the local 
literature as it stands is that it kind of doesn't recognize um, that people's relationship with food is kind of dictated by um, this legacies of class and, and race and colonialism. That's my problem with Google. Um, but at the same time, I also see communities that have problems with living in food deserts or not getting the access to the health care that they need, kind of using the mentality of local or, or they're kind of using local in a way that fits their own cultural and economic needs by coming together and saying, you know, this plot of land hasn't been used next to this building for a long time, so let's you know, put some raised beds and um, start producing our local food because we can't actually go out and afford the foods at the farmer's market because it's actually too expensive or it's not located in our communities. Does that make sense to answer? But that's yeah. just like a small slice of what I see in the Bay Area. Um, but then at the same time, I think, um, like my parents, you know, they're working class people. They're like a pub. They're in like New England, and my mom loves her super Walmart, you know, because like, wow, I finally have access to food that's easy to get. And I, you know, who am I to go and tell my mom at this point, like, you know, you shouldn't be going to Walmart, but what other options does she have? So um, it gets complicated because, like, for her, that is local, even though, you know, there's, if you read about, you know, how horrible Walmart is, um, it's, it's not, it's not the most ethical thing for some people, but you know, for this community, that's how they're actually able, my mom and dad are able to get cheaper organic foods. I don't know if Walmart still makes that, you know, but I remember for a time my mom's like, I got my organic bag of spinach for like a dollar. I'm like, cool, I get it for five bucks. So obviously I can see why you're going to Walmart for your organic spinach, and that's local for them. Uh, so I think um, a lot of the, the, the local and slow food talk can be kind of elitist and snobby uh, in a way that you know, I find more pure and more ethical than you because I, I can do this local thing, whether it's local, locally raised you know, cow that I'm eating or a locally raised kale. I think like what, what undergirds that, like those are actual commodities as well with meaning and social media and what kind of undergirds that and that, that language within local and so forth. Like, to give a long answer to your question. Well, yeah, I was just going to mention in response to that the book Cultivating Food Justice. Yeah. I think you wrote a chapter in and we read for a class, a number of us, um, last term. I think it has a bunch of good stuff around kind of issues of race and class. Um, and food. Yeah, it was actually, you read my mouth, actually. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> we we're going to talk about that. So there's this book that we're talking about, Cultivating Food Justice, uh, Race, Class, and Sustainability. It just came out through MIT Press this past fall, and it's a collection of about 17 critical essays that kind of tackle this. Okay, let's, we, we appreciate, you know, Alice Waters, and we appreciate what Michael Pollan has done, I guess, to some degree, but they never engage in <laughs> class and race. They just never engage in that. They seem to assume everybody is like white and middle to upper class and living in the Bay Area. So you know, what, what does justice um, look like in marginalized communities? You know? And like that's, I think that's a good place to kind of start looking at it. And there's you know, essays that kind of look out the problems with local and slow food. I think, I can't remember the other book, because there was a new book, a book, Food Justice, another book that came out by Gottlieb and Joshi, that's a good one to look at. Um, and then um, Julie Guffman has a new book, uh, it's called Weighing In, and it's like um, capitalism and the limitations of, I can't remember, but it's a good book because it kind of talks, again, she starts off with, you know, she's a, she's this um, white 50 something year old woman uh, professor at UC Santa Cruz, and she talks about how she teaches students about food and food studies, and most of them, she's like, oh wow, I'm really impressed by all of these um, largely white middle class students coming to me and, you know, I want to save, you know, people of color and go to their communities and teach them how to eat real food. Like, how offensive is that to actually go to someone's community and say, you know, I'm going to teach you how to eat real food. And um, she writes about it, so really, I like it so far. She's a, she's a good author to talk about this, but she kind of talks about this problem where, you know, you go in and, like, local is the answer local, local, or teach them real food. Just like the whole, how the language is so colonialistic. And a lot of the kids who have good intentions don't even realize that it's offensive. And then they come back like, I don't understand why the kids weren't interested in this. And she talks about how you know, some of the students went and proposed to um, students of color in a particular area, you know what, you should go and get your hands dirty and go work in a farm. The kids were like, my ancestors did that shit for like 400 years. <laughs> 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 Free, you know, like that was the response. Like, like that was, I thought that was really interesting. That that was her, like, you know, her students. She was kind of amazed by this. So, anyway, <laughs> but if, um, read her work. She talks about. Um, 
she takes a critical whiteness lens to the local and slow movement, and you know, she understands that a lot of the students come in with good intentions, but um, when you come in with, which is largely a Eurocentric, colonialistic way of approaching, approaching ethics, and kind of like helping the, the non-white other, it becomes a problem even within food justice, or your sense of food justice in local. Um, oh, I saw her back there first. Write the link of the entire talk she gave at UC Davis, and then Berkeley she talks again about animals. Um, but she, I, I wasn't at the Berkeley talk, but I was at the Davis talk. Um, she didn't get too much into that. Okay. Um, but when I had asked her the question, I had said, you know, I'm Bruce Harper, I'm doing this work, and a lot of black women, you know, were interested in veganism, but also because a lot of us kind of see parallels to how, you know, we were bred like cows, and then we were forced to, you know, breastfeed the white slave masters' babies. And a lot of us, you know, when we see the um, kind of a domination and exploitation of the reproductive uh, capacities of other animals and taking away their babies the way, like, you know, black mama's babies were taken away from them, we, we don't, we feel like, you know, why, it's my responsibility to actually not let that happen again, even if it's not to a human, but to another being who clearly would, you know, take away the, the lamb or the, the baby cow from the mom. Like, the cow or the sheep is freaking, yeah, sorry for swearing, but. Uh, they're like they're freaking out. Like, obviously, there's like there's something there. There's something there that is wrong. That they're sentient enough to know that their baby is leaving them. I do not want to um, kind of continue that particular way of colonizing a sentient and reproductive capacities. So um, that's something at least that I think we've talked about a bit in the Sister Vegan Project. Not enough, uh, but I think uh, like when I'm looking at Angela Davis and how she's kind of looking at how people and objects have been commodified. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if she kind of understands that within the matrix of oppression and um, within capitalism, how, you know, um, that chicken that has come to the plate uh, through so much cruelty, like to get that chicken, someone had to give birth to that chicken, someone had to take it away. And, um, you know, I don't see why that couldn't be connected to or really understand how that's part of how, um, in some way, shape, or form, that African Americans or Af people of African descent who were, you know, forced into child slavery, you know, how that it looks strikingly kind of familiar. I'm not saying it's the same thing, but if you can understand um, the whole matrix of how oppression and colonialism and domination works, um, I I wouldn't be surprised that Angela probably has uh, similar views on that. I'm just trying to I'm trying to figure out, you know, how to use her what she had said about Occupy, just understanding structural violence on, on like all these forms. And she even talked about it, like what you're saying, you know, you know, we're here at UC Davis, it's a land grant institution, and we have to actually acknowledge that we're all privileged because there are, you know, indigenous people who are dead. And um, a lot of them who are, um, I think they actually built on top of uh, a lot of indigenous people's graves, you know, so you can go to school. So, you know, so she's kind of talking about, you know, things like that or um, particular uh, products that we still use that are um, contingent upon oppression and exploitation. It's really, it's really hard. It's really hard to kind of uh, work through it. And I think she, like, if you listen to her, she kind of provides this overall arching framework to understand solidarity because she's like, social justice cannot be achieved if it's just like, you know, one-dimensional. She's like, it has. She said it has to be feminist, has to be anti-transphobic, has to be um, anti-homophobic, anti-sexist. Like she went through everything, and and it has to be anti-species. She doesn't say species, but she says that you know we have to. Um, understand how we treat animals and how the cruelty behind it kind of is an indication of how our minds have been colonized by capitalism in a very, in a very scary way. 
I guess just to jump off that, one, one of the words that seems to be missing from a lot of the critical animal studies is just domestication in general. Mm -hmm. And thinking about domestication as uh, the, the basis for commodity culture, for labor capitalism. And so I was interested in how, um, and going back to what you said, something in the beginning of what an, what an Afrocentric uh, approach to the question of the animal would look like. Because we, you know, we have this tradition of European philosophers criticizing the discourse of animality, but um, you know, Queen uh, Al Alfua? Afua. Afua, uh, you know, she was, she brought up Egypt as this kind of original source of purity. Yeah, she, and it's like a specific, uh, it's southern, specific. southern Kemetic Egypt. Yeah, just so, yeah. Well, were, did they practice animal domestication there? Or, you know, what other, uh, what about hunter gatherers? So this is the thing, because I'm still writing the chapter. Right now, I'm looking at her imagined conceptualization of what she thought southern Kemetic Egypt was. So for her, she, her research shows that, you know, it was raw foods and um, animals were not domesticated for consumption. But I do want to know, because I've seen this with African holistic vegans, or who practice vegan diets, that um, they still may wear, like they still may um, wear something on the animal, or they still may wear leather. So that's the part I'm trying to understand. And this is a good question because um, if you, I think it's in the book Hood, is it Hood Health? Hood Health book, uh, which is an Afrocentric approach to veganism. Um, there's the, the, a lot of the people who talk about why you shouldn't eat animals, it's not because of two it's because like a pig is a filthy animal, it's a swine, and all, and all these things that, I was like, well that's interesting, that it's being, you're, you don't want to eat the animal because, okay, you think it's unhealthy to eat it, but you, you're also constructing like the pig as this dirty animal. And I find, I, and I, that's a good question, I want to know, um, you know, how, in terms of domestication, you know, do they domesticate animals for other reasons, but not for consumption? And you know, we're at least in um, I know in the African holistic community, there's just like this aversion toward eating pigs, not because the pig suffers, but because the pig is seen as a dirty animal. So that's a, like, that's a good question. I and I can't right now I can't really f figure it out or find it in depth because like there is literature that actually talks about like Africa, um, pre-colonial parts of Africa as vegan. Like I have to kind of read beneath lines and, and kind of talk to other people in that community. So it's more like it's an oral history or it's like this imagined community. So I think if I can't if I can't get actual primary data, it's still very interesting to kind of use the narratives that have been um, said over and over again with that community and really look at what's interesting that they, they construct animals as unhealthy to eat, but at the same time um, they think particular animals are dirty or nasty. And then linking in, well, like Europeans are dirty and nasty I look at it, even dirty and nasty pig. Like it's just like, and then it starts getting like anti-white rhetoric and stuff. And how it's infused. Yeah, it's it's interesting, but awesome. yes. Um, yes. Uh, I was just wondering because you have talked about racialized colonialism mm -hmm. um, and then different approaches to veganism, and then so where you talk about the uh, white approach to veganism um, and then the African American uh, approach to veganism. Have you done any research on like other colonialized areas, areas such as like South America? <coughs> No, I have not. Um, that's because with my dissertation work, it's got to be so specific. Like it's already, she's like, you're, you're, it's 300 pages. I want it down to 200. So it's, it's got to be like uber specific. So I'm really only just focusing on Queen of Food and just focusing on Sacred Woman and just like one chapter in Sacred Woman. Um, and I want it like after it would be interesting to start doing kind of comparatives and seeing how colonialism has shaped, you know, particular cultural <laughs> concepts of veganism and vegetarianism. No, not yet. Not not in the book itself, but well, um, you said it was online. but it's online, like on Facebook. <laughs> it's an online community, um, and then and then I have a Yahoo group. But the Facebook, there's like 450 of us, and we're talking all the time. So like, um, it's uh, it's focused on you know women of African descent who practice veganism and allies. So anybody who's just kind of interested in not just women of African descent practicing veganism, but all the, the other things that we talked about, like your question and stuff. So anyone is invited to join if they want to kind of talk about these things that are related to Yes? Um, I said something to say what we're here to talk about somewhat feminism and um, and food and it has to 
do with what both of these people said, I, I just want to mention I think it's realistic to treat all things as all plants um, as sovereign, I guess, as wild, like uh, realistic to get our food from wild plants. However, in cities and, you know, people talk, I don't know, I don't like the word transition, but um, it may not be realistic coming from cities, like to eat wild plants. You can have some wild plants, but anyway, I just wanted to bring that up because that's what some of my family's um, dealing with is trying to live. They don't, they would rather go live in the woods than like pick another domesticated plant, you know, and, and treat plants like they can be owned as well in, the, in our gardens or whatever. But um, what I really wanted to ask your thoughts on were, um, if you remember using the phrase elements in the womb um, in your talk, I don't know if you don't, but those are not familiar. I didn't know what you were referring to when you said it, um, and I'm not, I was taking notes and I missed the context exactly, but um, still I can ask like, what connection, I suppose, what, um, what any possible elements in the womb would relate to? Oh, ailments. Oh, I'm sorry. Ailments? Ailments. Yeah, I thought you said elements, but you, you said ailments. Ailments. That's probably Yeah, that's what I was saying. Yeah, <laughs> elements or illness in the womb. Yeah. Okay, having to do with, um, with what food we're getting. So you had a question about that, or you want well, to? Well, I have a question about what you meant by that, but you probably meant ailments, and that's yeah. different, <laughs> and that makes much more sense. Okay. <laughs> I talk. I, I was probably talking really fast, so so yeah, ail ailments, ailments or illness. Mm -hmm. That's what. And that um, she proposes certain foods that um, black women. I'm sure it's all women, but she proposes you know culture specific to women of African descent. Um, you know, she proposes like you know. If you eat cheese and processed foods, um, it's going to create tumors and cysts in the womb and breast cancer. And um, I know there's actually like there's a lot of nutritional science kind of looking at you know foods that cause cancer and foods that don't. Um, so some of what she says is legitimate, but I also at the same time I, I find it problematic that it's, she's only kind of focusing on food because you can eat really healthy and inhale particular, I don't know, chemicals that still give you cancer um, because you live in a place where it's not healthy. So I'm wondering to what degree can um, you know, her womb regimen help if you're still living in a very like environmentally toxic area? Um, you know, so, and, and I'm trying to figure out you know, why she, at least a sacred woman, why she doesn't mention more of that. It's not just food, but there's so many other things. But she does talk about thoughts and emotions. She's very kind of quote unquote esoteric where if you're always angry, then manifest as you know, cancer in your womb. And that anger comes from eating too many Dunkin' Donuts, you know. So I want to know, you know, well, what about, you know, I, I know there are people I've met who are, who've been raw food vegans or vegans, regardless of how they ethnically or racially identify, for years. And they're like, I don't understand. I was just diagnosed with, like, diabetes or high blood pressure or cancer. And, um, you know, they're kind of confused because I, I ate this pure diet, but I'm so sick. And I kind of find that confusion interesting because um, you know, a lot of people get trapped in if you live a particular ethical way, then you shouldn't deserve or you shouldn't become sick. And it kind of closes you off to really understanding, um, I think, social justice and activism and real environmental justice in um, a way that's holistic. So yeah, you may you know, eat organic food that's vegan for 10 years, but um, you know, have you also paid attention to um, where you're living? You know, if you live in a place where they're dumping stuff into your water system, and are you doing something about it? If you, know, you live in, um, somewhere where um, they created a new building for your your um, you to live, and they used um, you know non-green building attire, I'm sorry, equipment uh, stuff to build your building, and you know have you been inhaling that for ten years and no? So I think you know, get back to your question about um, or your statement about how elements of the womb kind of uh, come from food and the food's perspective. Uh, I think uh, if you, for people kind of just focus on food as a way to make my body pure, I, I think it kind of it gets lost in, I think, a more productive type of social justice. Um, that kind of needs to acknowledge the whole picture of that, if that makes sense. Um, so the next workshop was started, too. Um, and I just wanted to know, 
Um, so, if anyone has questions, um, you can just email me at breezeharper at gmail.com. And uh, like I said, I have a newborn and a three year old, and I'm really busy, so <laughs> I, I will acknowledge that you sent me something, but I may not be able to respond. So it's no offense, it's just that like, I don't speak. So I don't want to have time to make a try to get an dissertation. So, but thank you for um, lending me your ear and kind of helping me through my dissertation work and me kind of sharing with you the work I'm doing. And I'm hoping, in a, like in less than a year, um, the whole thing will be more coherent and then you can read what I was trying to say as a final product and um, hopefully you'll benefit from that as well. Thank you.